Good to see everyone. Thank you all for uh, being here this morning. Our, our title for our class this fall is Discipleship and Daily Life. And uh, there, there's a lot that's in, involved in what we mean by that, but uh, primarily it's about uh, being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and then ultimately, hopefully, do, being able to do as Jesus did. So, uh, following in the footsteps of Jesus, being transformed into his likeness, these are the kinds of things we're going to be trying to uh, work on. As a consequence, the class will both in involve instruction of information, or <coughs> giving of information, we need information. Uh, but the goal of that is for transformation, and, and that doesn't happen by sitting in a lecture. Um, it involves learning to practice daily habits that put us in the place where God's blessings and grace that transforms can freely flow. And we're all being formed, I'll get into this a little bit later, all the time by various forces and by various habits that we practice. And uh, those forces and habits largely make us who we are today and who we will be in the future. And so this class is really for those who feel there's a gap, a distance between the lives that they're actually living and Jesus' invitation to all of us to follow him into an abundant life, um, a life of rest for the weary soul, a life that is characterized by the fruit of the Spirit being, as it were, naturally born. In other words, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, gentleness. Uh, these are sort of the things that just are who we are. And it's not like necessarily we're trying to do that. Have you ever uh, um, seen an orchard uh, and watched, and you've gone out to the... Um, What's the orchard out here? Jackson. Jackson. <laughs> and watch the peach trees just <gasps> trying to make peaches or apples. <laughs> uh, they don't. How do they do it? It's naturally, it's uh, a branch abiding in the, the vine or into the trunk is naturally receiving an energy and, and flowing from it and through it the produce of the fruit is the most natural thing in the world for that kind of a, of a tree. And ultimately, we should aspire as disciples of Jesus to bear those kinds of fruit, the characteristics that so mark his life in our own lives. It's going to look different for each of us, uh, but what we're, we're looking for is the character, the attributes of Christ lived out in your personality that's based on your station in life, uh, your, again, your, your personality, uh, your um, age, all of these things will be different factors, but the same basic character uh, at present in our lives. So Jesus manifests in our lives as a result of our being his disciple. All right, so let me uh, just uh, begin this, then with a word of prayer, and we'll get started in our lesson this morning. Father, we're thankful for this family, this body of believers. We ask, Father, that you would fill us with a zeal for your house, for your people, for your church, and that we would strive to um, love one another as you have loved us, that we would have a care and concern about the world around us and want to expand the borders of your kingdom so that um, your will is done in this earth as it is already in heaven. Father, we ask your special blessing on this class and on each person who participates in it this fall. We pray that it won't uh, just be business as usual for us where we, we come and we sit and we listen, but that we learn to uh, take into ourselves the daily habits that we'll be talking about and that we see lived out in the life of Jesus so that we can be more like him. We ask that you be present to us this morning. 
as we go through this discussion. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> All right, so if you were a first century Jew and you encountered Jesus, he came to your hometown in his ministry. Uh, we, we often perhaps, because of certain things that we focus on and that are uh, that catch our attention, we might think, well, well, here comes the miracle worker, here comes the Messiah, uh, here, here comes uh, the Son of God. Uh, but most likely, if you were a first century Jew and Jesus came to your town and you saw him walking into town or happened uh, to hear him as he taught in your synagogue, your thought would probably most naturally be, is, oh, here's a rabbi. This is a rabbi. Uh, he, he most likely dressed like a, a rabbi and would have been viewed by people uh, as such. He would have come to your town with his yoke. Not Y-O-L-K, but Y-O-K-E. His yoke, not literally carrying one around, but that was a common uh, euphemism uh, in first century Judaism for the teachings and the way of life uh, and the interpretation of the Torah that various rabbis would use. So this is his yoke, that's, you know, come take my yoke, this is my way of understanding the scripture and living it out in your <coughs> life. In the 90 encounters that are recorded uh, of Jesus with people in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 60 times he's referred to in them as rabbi. Think about that. 60 times of the 90, he's called rabbi. A rabbi was a master who would gather disciples or uh, the Hebrew word Talmudim, um, Greek word that's translated disciples is methetes, but the Hebrew word that was perhaps one that would have been most common to the Jews were the, the, the Talmudim. So let's say that, the Talmudim. 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 So let's look at a few passages uh, that have some of this basic understanding of who Jesus was as a teacher, a rabbi, gathering his Talmudim, his disciples, his followers, What's another word we might use for those that were called to follow a rabbi? Students. 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 Disciple. Disciple. Follower. Follower. Is called out. Is called out. What about this word? This is one that I've come across recently in my studies that I think works pretty well for us in our maybe a little bit more modern way of, of, of thinking of things, but an apprentice. Your apprentices. Okay? Um, so maybe we'll use that word some too. But all of those are, are good. I've asked some of the uh, guys ahead of time to prepare to read these passages for us, but if you want to follow along, please uh, open your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 1. And I think, uh, Sterling, I think I asked you to do Mark 1, 16 through 20. So Mark 1, 16 through 20. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after them. Okay. So we've seen the word follow them, went after him. He's calling them. He's calling them to say, follow me, and you'll what? What will be the result? Yeah, you'll become fishers of men, uh, which, uh, again, also I've learned is uh, not an unusual expression that a rabbi would say about his disciples and that a uh, fisher of men uh, was, was basically someone who could catch or capture the imagination or the interest of uh, the people as he taught them the word of God. So I'll make you into what I uh, already am. So again, if our goals are to be with him, to be like him and ultimately to do as he does. We're seeing that Jesus at the outset of calling these men to be his Talmudim are telling them that the end result of this is they're going to do things similar to what he already is doing. All right, uh, Mark 2, 13 and 14. Go. And he went out again by the seashore, and all the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. 
As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. And he said to them, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. Uh, so he's calling people of different walks of life, right? So they're not all cut from the same cloth. We have fishermen. <coughs> Uh, and here we have uh, a tax collector who's likely a wealthy, uh, wealthy man, uh, and one uh, not looked too favorably upon by many of his uh, Jewish uh, counterparts because of their view of him having sold out to the Romans. As well. Jesus is going to bring them all together to form his group of, of Talmudim. Uh, Bruce, Mark. 3.13-19 And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, mm -hmm. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, <coughs> James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Very good, thank you, Bruce. So this is where, after having called these uh, many followers, and of course there were many others who, who followed Jesus on, on some level, but then, these 12 in particular would become uh, enrolled as his Talmudim, those who were with him 24-7, 365 days of the, the year, and would uh, be at his side. They would eat their meals with him. They would uh, dwell in the same places and be uh, together on an almost constant basis. And then finally, Mark 8, beginning in verse 34. Jesus broadens this call generally and says to the crowd, uh, calling to the crowd with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, who? Anyone. anyone. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? So, um, again, as we started off our discussion, Jesus is offering us an invitation to be his followers and to do so uh, in a way that uh, uh, is saving, uh, soul saving. It, it uh, um, draws our... In, the, with integrity, the entirety of our person into alignment with God's ultimate and good purpose for our existence. This is what Jesus is, is calling us to, and that invitation is extended to all, and there has to be a deliberate decision to become his follower, doesn't it? Um, a self-denial, uh, a willingness to take up the cross, and to follow him wherever he leads us and it's always going to be in a cruciform direction and, and a place in which we are called to self-denial, a willingness to suffer, a willingness uh, at perhaps uh, many junctures to be ostracized and to be uh, despised by the world, but all of this for the purpose of saving uh, our very identity, who we are, uh, our, our soul can be preserved through our union with Christ. So he isn't just all the time going around saying, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Son of God, believe in me, go to heaven when you die. But he is announcing the ar arrival of the kingdom of heaven, particularly that the, the, uh, the, the arrival of the kingdom of heaven is present in him. And now he is gathering uh, to him his Talmudim, his followers, his disciples, his apprentices, and um, before we go any further, I just want to quickly do a brief overview of the first century Hebrew educational system, if you will. It basically had three levels. First, there was the Beth Sefer, which meant the house of the book. And uh, 
all male children, apparently some female children would be in, included in this uh, and you would learn to read and, and primarily you would learn to read uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. You would be schooled in this and many uh, students by the time they were finished with this, and again it was uh, maybe up till about the age of 11 or 12, something like that, uh, most students would, I'm told, be able to pretty much recite the entire first five books of the Old Testament. So they would memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. And then that would, for the most part, uh, be the end of, of almost everyone's education. At that point, you would either learn your father's trade uh, or uh, you would be betrothed and soon married and begin uh, bearing children if you were a woman. So, uh, but there was a select few who showed exceptional promise uh, who would uh, be taken up into the Bet Talmud, the house of learning, in which all of the, not only the scriptures, but then all of the Jewish commentary on the scriptures that had been accumulated through the, uh, through the years would become the subject matter of your study. And you would study that for uh, several years, three, four, five years, perhaps, uh, if you continue to show great promise. And then if you were the very best of the best, the brightest of the, the brightest, then you would uh, perhaps find a rabbi who would one day look at you and see your potential, see your, uh, your, your outstanding aptitude for learning and say, follow me, uh, become one of my Talmudim. Uh, Jesus, of course, was not the only one uh, doing this. This had been something taking place for a long time. In fact, the practice seems to have begun with the Greeks. For example, what Aristotle was a disciple of Plato, and so it's swept throughout uh, the empire, and uh, the practice uh, was taken up by the, the Jews at this time and had been going on for, for quite a while. Uh, you perhaps heard of you know, Rabbi um, Hillel or uh, Rabbi uh, Shemaiah, Shemaiah. Shemaiah. Uh, Shemaiah, these other uh, great teachers who had their, their followers. So this was a common, uh, somewhat common uh, thing to experience. Now, uh, if you were fortunate enough, and this was what you were interested in, to become an apprentice to a rabbi, then there would be three things that you would do. Number one, you would be with your rabbi, and there was a phrase that we've uh, found that apparently was commonly used uh, in this era in which a blessing would be spoken over a, a, a rabbi's disciple and, and it was, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. In other words, may you have the privilege and blessing of walking so close in the footsteps of your master. The, the very dust of his feet is, becomes the thing that, 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 that constantly covers you. You're going to be with him, not just occasionally sitting down and, and learning a lesson, but learning a way of life, uh, learning his approach to life, his, his way of approaching God, his way of approaching life, his way of approaching and teaching the scripture, and you would try to learn and uh, duplicate everything that your master taught. And, and live. Then uh, not only be with your rabbi, which would be the first goal, but secondly to become like your rabbi, to become a fisher of men, uh, and then ultimately to do as your rabbi does, which would be to go and make disciples. If you, if you were, uh, you had to be the best of the best to get here, but then if even among the Talmudim you proved to be the best of the best of the best, then one day your rabbi might look at you and say, go and make disciples. Can you become a rabbi then? Yeah, if yeah. Be if, yeah, he, he would maybe at some point say, you know, you, I've taught you all that I can teach you and you have, uh, you have um, excelled in this and now you go and make disciples. <clears throat> uh, you go be a fisher of men as well. So this seems to have been the way that this uh, system, if you want to call it that, worked. <coughs> Lawrence, I've, I've heard that probably the most uh, adept comparison that we would be familiar with today would be someone who went to law school and then became a law clerk for a very you know, prominent judge 
and how that would kickstart their career. And at some point, you know, they break away from that judge and become their own. That's how I've heard it described as our most comparable in our system today. Okay, very good. So, uh, uh, excellent um, analogy for, for us to be helped in our thinking. So what I want to do now is just kind of take this and say that that is going to establish our three goals for this class. Uh, we need to have a reason for why we're doing what we're doing. And we want, uh, first of all, to learn over the course of the next four months how to, how to be with Jesus. Uh, how to be covered in the dust, as it were, of our rabbi. Now, <clears throat> that raises an immediate question. It should. Uh, what, what question does that raise? Sterling? He's not around. Yeah, well, he's not here. You know, I, I see how this worked for Peter, James, and John, and these others, and he called them, and anybody who wants to follow me, take it your cross, follow me, deny yourself. Uh, but, you know, we're 2,000 years down the road. Jesus has ascended to the Father's right hand. And uh, where does that uh, leave us? Well, I think that we have some very interesting help in making sense of this. Let's look now in John chapter 16. Y'all remember, uh, while you're turning there, how the disciples reacted to the news that Jesus gave them that he was going to be leaving. He was returning to the Father. Depression. They what? Depression. Depression? Did somebody over here say something? Shock and dismay. Shock and dismay, depression. Their hearts were troubled. Uh, this was not good news. <clears throat> Apparently, they did not feel... <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Apparently they did not feel as if, as Talmudim, they were prepared to become rabbis themselves. They were still in need of the presence of their master with them in order to do uh, the mission and the work that God was calling them <clears throat> uh, to do. So in John 16, beginning in verse uh, 6, Someone read that for me and save my voice. Verses 6 through 7. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Okay. So how does, how does he help them uh, with this problem that they're encountering? Jesus is leaving us. We're not prepared or equipped or uh, able to carry on the, the mission that he has begun. And Jesus says, no, it's actually better this way. Because, why? Yeah. When, I, when I'm gone, someone else, another helper will come uh, and enable you to fulfill the mission that you've, that you've been given. Um, let's look uh, again back uh, a couple chapters earlier in the same discourse, chapter 14. Uh, someone read verses 15 through 18. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot perceive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. And I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Wow, so here he, he makes explicit that he's going to uh, uh, send them a helper, another one that would enable and strengthen and sustain them for their mission. Um, and. Uh, that he's not going to leave them as orphans. So that's an interesting image. He sees them not only as his Talmudim, but as his children, as, as disciples. And I'm not going to leave you as orphans, but I um, will come to you. So in some sense, this helper, this other one, is in some sense also Jesus coming to them in another way. Okay, I, I will come uh, to you. Um, 
by means of this helper. And then verses uh, fifth, chapter 15, uh, which this whole chapter is, of course, really important for our discussion, but we'll focus in on verses 4 and 5, where he says, Abide in me. This goes back to our analogy of the fruit being born. Abide in me. What does the word abide mean? To live. Live in me. Abide in me. Stay with. Stay with me. Remain in me. Dwell. Dwell with me. So he's he's inviting them, even though he's going away, to remain in him, to stay connected with, to dwell with, to abide with him. The that same way. Because it's confusing to me. Okay. That he's leaving, but I'm still going to, basically, I'm still going to be with him. In the present with you. And you can and you can continue to remain to remain in me. Um, look at, uh, so we're, we're in chapter 15, verses 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I am in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Um, so here is uh, Jesus' promise that they can continue to remain or connect with, abide in him by means of the spirit of Christ that will come to them after he returns to the Father. And of course, I don't expect people to remember this far back, but in the spring we did the series on the I Believe series, and one of the lessons we talked about was the ascension. And the word that I used there for the ascension was the, that was the event that detonated everything else. Uh, uh, and the, 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 when Jesus goes up, of course, there's a 50 day delay, but then the Spirit comes down, and we see in the book of Acts, the apostles and I believe other disciples empowered by the presence of, of, of Christ at work in their lives to fulfill the mission that the, that the, that the new body of Christ uh, that, that inhabits the earth was, was called to fulfill. And they continue to do the work of Jesus in the world. In fact, I think the best way to think of Acts chapter 1 where it says Luke, the writer, that in the previous book, referring to the Gospel of Luke, he says, I uh, recorded all the things that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up into heaven. And think of Acts as the continuation of all that Jesus <coughs> continued to do and to teach after he was taken up into heaven. Okay? Uh, by means of his spirit, working through his people in the world. Okay? Um, so how, how can we be with Jesus? I want to show you one more passage before we leave this idea. Look in Galatians chapter 4. Start in verse 4. Galatians 4, beginning in verse 4. Paul says looking back on all this, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So, <clears throat> God sent His Son into the world. Jesus began uh, the mission he returned to the Father's right hand and poured out His Spirit into our hearts so that we may relate to God in the same way that Jesus related to God. And that it's better for us that He has gone away because Jesus, as long as He lived in the body in this world, could only be in one place at one time. But now He can be by His Spirit with everyone everywhere all the time and so we can abide in the vine we can remain in christ as his spirit is in our hearts training us to look to god 
as our dear and loving Father. So um, we can remain with Jesus and be with Jesus. In fact, um, hmm, something's not working right here. Yeah, be with Jesus. Uh, the first and primary goal of discipleship is learning to live in a constant state of awareness of an awareness of and connection to the Spirit of Christ. If we today want to be covered in our Master's dust and be able to bear the fruit of the Spirit naturally, then our first priority needs to be how can I awaken myself to the reality of the presence of the Spirit of Christ in my life on a moment by moment, day by day basis. Does that sound challenging? Very, very challenging. But I believe that uh, that is what we're after this fall. Uh, and I don't think that we're going to ever naturally bear the fruit of the Spirit apart from this. In fact, Jesus said to the disciples in John, apart from me, that is, if the, if the connection, if you're not abiding, dwelling, remaining in me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. Jesus has no confidence in you apart from him. And you, therefore, should have no confidence in yourself apart from him. But, he says, through dwelling in him, you can bear what? Much fruit. Much fruit. If this connection remains strong. So that's our, our first and primary goal. And we're going to learn in this trimester to implement practices that will help us to do this, to help us to be more aware, consciously aware of the presence of the Spirit of Christ in our lives. Dallas Willard, who's written and done extensive work in the area of spiritual formation and spiritual disciplines, <laughs> writes, the first and most basic thing that we can and must do is keep God before our minds. This is the fundamental secret in caring for our soul. Our part in practicing the presence of God, I love that phrase, practicing the presence of God, is to direct and redirect our mind constantly to Him. In the early part of our practicing, we may be challenged by our burdensome habits of dwelling on things less than God. Can anybody say amen? Amen. <laughs> He's so gracious. <laughs> but these are habits and not the law of gravity and can be broken. A new grace, a new grace filled habit will replace the former ones as we take intentional steps for keeping God before us. Soon our minds will return to God as the needle of the compass constantly returns to north. If God is the great longing of our souls, he will become the pole star of our inward being. Imagine yourself in four months being able to constantly reorient yourself toward a conscious awareness of God's presence in your life. And to have the Spirit of Christ that enables you to cry out, Abba, Father, dearest, Father, and living your life throughout the day with this with this awareness. With that yeah. car passing through the intersection <laughs> on a red light, I almost hit it. Conscious awareness of his presence. Yes. And that's very good because it's as we get into it, we're going to see that it's things like that. Interruptions. The daily routines of life. We're not. We're not going to. We are going to talk some about. Hey, we need your your devotional time. We're not going to say no. Don't do that. But it's much more than that. Rather than setting aside a part of our day as our time to be spent with God, we want to see how we can bring God's presence, the Spirit of Christ, down into our interruptions, our conversations with our spouses and our children, with our uh, Instagram accounts, with our waking up in the morning, with our going to sleep at night, with our brushing our teeth and showering and preparing meals 
and using these things as triggers in our minds to encounter the living God. That's what we're after. And that's why we're not making the changes and strides in our life as disciples that we need to because we are not with our Master. We're not with Jesus. We're not consciously aware of His abiding presence. What's that song? A sense of thy abiding presence. Uh, what's that song? Be with you. I cannot live without you. A constant sense of thy abiding presence. There's, there's because listen, when it comes to Christianity, discipleship, the best thing about following Jesus is what? Jesus. <laughs> That's the best part of this, is you get to be with Jesus. So, that's the second thing. Having been with Jesus, we want to become like Jesus. This is what theologians refer to as sanctification or spiritual formation. And spiritual formation is the process of increasing by the character traits of Jesus as we walk in the easy yoke of our Lord. I want to say quickly, and we'll come back to this Wednesday night, spiritual formation is an option. You are undergoing spiritual formation Every day, every moment of your life, you are being formed into something that you are going to be forever. And your Instagram account, your other social media, your habits, routines, the things that you say to yourself in your mind, all of these things are forces that are working to shape you into the person, have worked to shape you into the person you are today, and will be shaping you into the person that you are in the future. This is why we have to have the abiding presence of Christ with us all the time to counter form us against the ways of the world. Romans 12, don't be conformed to the image of this world, but be reformed, renewed by the remaking of your mind through this conscious awareness of God's presence and knowing and doing His will. And uh, I was just going to... Uh, jump to the, the last one. Finally, we want to be able to do as Jesus, to participate in God's work, in the work of making things on earth as in heaven. <clears throat> um, and let me just say about that, that these goals won't just happen because we'd like them to. A deliberate approach to living in a, in a, as an apprentice to Jesus is necessary. Now, let me try to encourage you in the last five minutes that we have uh, about how we're going to proceed. First, just to think about what we've talked about already and the challenging thing of, of how, we, how can I ever get there? How can I ever have my mind in the place that it needs to be or be as obedient as I ought to be or be doing the things that Jesus did? How many of you uh, have run a marathon? Raise your hand if you've ever run a marathon. We've got, we've got four or five marathoners in here. Uh, Jared? 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 Close enough. Jared? <laughs> could you run a marathon in the morning? If you got up at 7 o'clock in the morning, could you go run a marathon? All, like, I just get one Just day. get up and go run 26.2. <laughs> no. <minutes. laughs> I don't know if I could get a mile in. Yeah. <laughs> well, we usually tell people that discipleship is about trying. What if I got there with you, or one of these other people who have run a marathon, and they, every time you started getting tired about the end of your first mile, and said, Jared, try harder. <laughs> that might get you two miles. It, it makes some difference. Quicker to death, I think. Quicker to death. <laughs> here's, here's what I'm wanting us to see. It's not about trying. It's about training. Okay. Um, and so we're going to be implementing each week a, a new discipline, a new habit, I think is a better word, to start working on so that you can begin to bring conscious awareness of the presence of the Lord into your life. And as we go through the course of four months, hopefully we'll be able to implement more and more ways of doing this. And we'll find that just as Jared could only run, Jared could only <laughs> run one mile tomorrow, if he kept running one mile for a week or two, he would find that he could run two miles. And over a course of like nine months, if he stayed with it, 
guess what? He would be the kind of person for whom running 26.2 miles was possible. I challenge you, bud. It's a challenge, right? <laughs> None of us are going to wake up tomorrow and live out a 24-hour day in the conscious awareness of the Spirit of Christ in our life. But maybe if yesterday you spent five minutes aware of that, or two minutes aware of that, maybe tomorrow you could spend six or seven minutes aware of that. So the handout that you have <clears throat> contains just a very brief summary of what we have covered. Um, but it also contains some questions. Those questions are as important as anything I've said this morning because this is your opportunity to take a few minutes to sit down and evaluate yourself and to think about some things and it also includes one very specific habit to begin to practice. And that habit's just when you wake up every morning before you immediately, you know, maybe if you're I usually don't wake up with an alarm, but if you wake up with an alarm, you know, turn the alarm off, or if you just wake up on your own before you do anything else, get out of bed and start checking your email or whatever you do. Even if it's only three minutes, just lie there with an awareness, become aware of the fact that God is there. He's been there all night. He never sleeps or slumbers. He watches over you in your sleep. He's, woke, he's awakened you. He's woke you up. He woke you up. <laughs> in your right mind, as best it can be in early morning. And you just be aware that he's there. And be aware that in Christ, he loves you, he's accepted you, you're his, you belong to him. And uh, just linger with that for just a few minutes. And then go on with your day. And just see if that practice doesn't open up opportunities throughout the rest of the day for little opportunities for that same kind of conscious awareness to break in. We're going to run one mile this week, okay? One mile. So please do that work, uh, and then we're going to primarily spend Wednesday nights discussing, sharing with one another our experiences. This is what happened when I, here's how I failed, this is that kind of thing. So really excited about this trimester. Thank you all for your attention this morning.